As we look at the Sermon on the Mount this morning, we could ask ourselves the question, you know, what does your life look like? How has your life changed? What impact does God have on your life when you follow Jesus? What's that look like? I know that seems like a fairly simple and straightforward question. It seems to me that when you follow Jesus, something in your life should change. There should be something different about you. I remember that when we lived back in Nebraska in the 90s, we got to experience what folks could call the golden age of Cornhusker football. <laughs> Nebraska won three national championships in four years while we were there. And at one point, the team won 30 straight games in Memorial Stadium in Lincoln. It's an amazing record. Visiting teams dreaded coming to play there. Nebraska players, it seemed, walked with a swagger. They knew that they were part of something special. And it's the sort of thing that happens when you're associated with winning. You stand out from others. There's just something different about you. People notice that. Now, shouldn't there be something different about us? Because we're associated with Jesus. I mean, Nebraska football is one thing, but this being with Jesus is on a whole other level. And if that's true, what should that difference look like? Over the past few weeks, we've been following the life story of Jesus as it's told by the writer of the Gospel of Matthew. And you'd agree with me that it's been an amazing life so far. We read that even before he was born, Jesus was named and pronounced special to his parents by an angel. Jesus' birth attracted the attention of wise sages from a distant land. His family was forced to flee the rage of a king who would do just about anything to keep his throne, even if it meant putting scores of infant children to death in Bethlehem. We don't know much about Jesus' childhood. But Matthew does tell us about his baptism. And Matthew records a voice from heaven telling us that he was special, that he was beloved, that he was God's son. And then that claim was put to the test as Jesus, as we read last week, faced the strong power of temptation in the wilderness. That's what we know about Jesus so far in Matthew. He returns from temptation. He calls some fishermen to follow him. And he begins to touch lives. He begins to change the world. Just like that, it seems. <coughs> and right before the words that Don read this morning, Matthew tells us just whose lives were touched and how Jesus changed the world around him. Here's what Matthew writes. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he cured them. And great Crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Great crowds followed him. Great crowds containing sick people, helpless people, neglected people, ignored people followed him. And he cured them. And he, they followed him more. These crowds were the ones who heard the sermon Matthew writes about this morning. These were folks who had been pushed out on the margins of society. No one wanted to have anything to do with them. And we need to remember that when we read these words that have become so familiar to us from the fifth chapter of Matthew. Because Jesus' words are understood best if we put them into their proper context. I remember Robert Schuller the pastor of the Chris Cathedral at that time in Garden Grove, California in the 80s. He wrote a book on the Beatitudes and it became a bestseller. And he understood blessed to mean happy. And he titled his book, The Be Happy Attitudes. <laughs> it sounds like a, a Robert Schuller title. <laughs> but I don't think that title reflected this part of scripture then and I, and I still don't. Jesus is not talking about a happy face kingdom of heaven where you put the best possible face on your situation. He's talking about a vision of God's kingdom where real people 
with real problems meet the real healing, saving love of God. Matthew's story of the life of Christ was written to people who were familiar with mourning. The killing of the infants in Bethlehem by Herod was still fresh in the minds of those who heard this story for the first time. They might have been hearing Matthew being read while sitting in the ruins of the temple in Jerusalem after that city was destroyed by the Romans. They knew what it was like to mourn. They knew how it felt to have their faith shaken to its roots. They knew what it was like to be poor in spirit. These words of Jesus would have rung true to them. In spite of the terrible circumstances they found themselves in, they held on to the good news that God was with them. That's the word that comes to us from Matthew over and over again like a broken record, but, but the best kind of broken record, that God is with us. From the beginning to the end, you hear that, that refrain lifted up by Matthew. Jesus tells the crowd that those who are in mourning will be comforted. Now, comfort is an interesting word. I came across this old Peanuts cartoon that, that gives a pretty good picture of how most people handle a call to comfort. See, so you have Snoopy there, a young Snoopy. This is an old cartoon. And, and Linus and Charlie Brown say, you know, Snoopy looks kind of cold, doesn't he? And then Linus says, yeah, I'll say he does. Maybe we better go over and, and comfort him. And so they walk over. Be of good cheer, Snoopy. Yes, be of good cheer. <laughs> you know, it's really not too hard, is it, to, to, to see that, to offer a, a hug or a, or a hand holding and then walk away. We're pretty good at that. But the word Matthew uses goes way beyond that. Inside that word, there's a call to the mourner to get on his feet and to move forward into life. And that's a whole different thing, isn't it? Jesus is calling the, the reader to stand up in the middle of the ruins of Jerusalem and continue to walk forward in faith with other believers. Comfort comes when you know that you're part of a family, when you know that you're part of a community. And you can take all the blessings that Jesus preaches about in this sermon and see them in the context of a faith family, of living together and growing together and changing the world together. That's where the kingdom of heaven begins to take root, when we come together and live those promises out as a family. I've always been impressed with the way that Gilbert Presbyterian Church has seen itself called to be a family. It's a comfortable, it's an exciting way for us to describe ourselves, at least on the surface. We hear the word family, and we know that it's tossed around in all sorts of different contexts. We know that family values are lifted up as essentials for building a healthy society. But when it comes to defining what family really means, well, then we're all over the map. And the same thing is true when we see ourselves living in the kingdom of heaven as a family together. If being a family means that we agree on everything, well, then maybe we better step back and take another look at who we are. Being a church family carries with it the same highs and lows, the same reasons for celebration, and the same reasons for frustration that we experience in any family. There can be arguments, there can be hurt feelings, there can be power struggles, but the sign of a healthy family is the ability to love one another through all of that. And as you know, when your families are in the church family, that's not always an easy thing to do. Jesus makes no bones about the fact that our lives don't have to be perfect before the kingdom can begin to take root. He says we're blessed even when we're poor in spirit. We're blessed when we're meek, when we seek justice. We're blessed when we're merciful in a world that seeks vengeance. And we're blessed in, when our hearts are pure, <coughs> even when we, when we live in a world of anger and mistrust. We're blessed when we work for peace. We're blessed when we get beaten down for our efforts. We are blessed by God 
Because God is planting kingdom seeds in the world through us. But you know that's sort of a mixed blessing? Jesus does not promise a bed of roses or an easy path. All he promises is that God will be with us no matter what. And that's so like Matthew to make that point and make sure that it's driven home again and again through his gospel, that God is with us. And isn't that what the strongest families are built on, that foundation of no matter what? A bride and groom stand before God and pledge their love to each other for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, as long as they both shall live. And that's kind of a long-winded way of simply saying, no matter what. And we strive to bring up our children so that they will know that our love for them is unconditional. It's there for them, no matter what. A strong church family is bonded together by that same sense of knowing that God will love us no matter what and that we should be there for each other under those same conditions no matter what. Because we've been blessed by God, the kingdom has taken root here. Even in our humanness, even in our messiness, our fits and our starts, we know that we are blessed. And so, we are different. God has given us that label of blessing. Remember back in September when we started this walk through the scripture story together? Remember God's call to Abram? That he was blessed too, but he was blessed for a purpose, for a reason. He was called to be a blessing to the nations. Through him, we were told, all people would be blessed. God has labeled us blessed. Can people see that as a trait that sets us apart? as the GPC family? Is that light that the choir sang about shining? Are we bringing a flavoring to the world around us? And I would say yes. The hungry are fed at sites like Paz de Cristo and East Valley Men's Center. The poor are housed through the ministries of UMOM. The ragged are clothed through the gifts of the outreach ministry at Guadalupe Presbyterian Church. The homeless are gifted by our HPAC program the mission of the larger denominational church is supported by a mission pledge that we make each year. The light of the kingdom is shining because God has blessed you. God has blessed us all. And that light continues to shine because you have made the commitment to be a family. And you have made the commitment to care for each other. Even when you don't always agree. And sometimes you don't. Even though we have just about every point of the political spectrum in our pews, and we do. Even though we see the world out there through many different sets of eyes and many different experiences, we are all blessed and the kingdom has taken root in this family. This family of faith we call Gilbert Presbyterian Church. You are children of God. And the victory has been won for you by grace. And I believe that you all look different to the world because of that truth. Blessed are you, family of faith. Let your light shine.